life on wheels. Last September, when Dr. Lin, my Pacific Heights-based orthopedist, told me over the phone that I had a stress fracture in my right leg, it didn't seem all that bad. What you need to do, he advised, is get a chaise lounge and get two big, strong men to carry you around everywhere. <laughs> or just rest, swim, and take 1,000 IUs of calcium and 2,000 IUs of vitamin D. I thought I rested plenty by driving two and a half hours each way to Monterey once a week. plenty by driving two and a half hours each way to Monterey once a week, only to move around 50 pound otters and then spend the rest of the week catching up on Grey's Anatomy, 30 Rock, The Office, an extreme makeover, weight loss edition. <laughs> In reality, this was better known as the first stage of grief, denial. By November, the pain had worsened so much that I went on crutches and back to Dr. Lin. In his office, he pulled up my bone scan results. Oh, oops, it looks like you have stress fractures in both legs. That's why your left leg is hurting you too. His part Chinese, part gremlin face smiled at me gleefully, as if that would distract me from his negligence. Are you fucking kidding me? You gave me the wrong results in September? I had moved on to the second stage, anger. Except that I didn't actually say that because I hate conflict. Instead, I chose to never see him again, an exact revenge the way most web-savvy people do. I wrote a scathing review on Yelp. <laughs> the official diagnosis was that I had bilateral tibial stress fractures. In layman's terms, that means last September, I was the idiot who thought it was a great idea to jump repetitively on concrete without shoes on during a mirroring exercise in a life coaching course, appropriately called in the bones. <laughs> on my way to Wine Jar on December 31st, 2010, I re-injured myself while pushing off too hard on concrete, attempting to get a piggyback ride from my boyfriend, Alex. By the next morning, it hurt to stand even when using crutches. By the end of the week, I was in a wheelchair, unable to bear any weight on my legs without wincing in pain. I was still angry at the doctor, at New Year's Eve, at myself, and now at being in a wheelchair. The most unfair thing about it all is that as a Chinese person, I largely internalized my anger, which catapulted me past stage two and straight into stage four, depression. And in stage four, I threw myself the biggest pity party and no one was invited. <laughs> I thought it'd make me feel better, and by better, I mean worse. I spent weeks not leaving my apartment, feeling incapable of going out. I cultivated mass amounts of learned helplessness. In reality, I spent a lot of my time relearning how to do a lot of common day things, like getting down the hallway without smashing my hands between the wall and the wheelchair, or like going to the bathroom. Instead of just walking into it, I now had to lower myself to the ground, scoot across the bathroom floor, pull myself up onto the toilet, shimmy my pants off, only to reverse that process when I was done. When you're handicapped, first on crutches, and then upgrade to a wheelchair, the texture of the city changes. It wasn't until my first chaperoned outing in a wheelchair that I realized that Jackson Street, where my apartment is, was on a slight incline. Yeah. One block seemed like an epic distance. Steep downhills made me visualize the scene in Naked Gun 33 and a third, <laughs> where O.J. Simpson's character, wheelchair bound, careens down the stairs in a baseball stadium, eventually getting launched straight into the air. Slight uphills appeared insurmountable, not to mention excruciating on your arms to wheel up, like being a skier who's constantly pulling her way uphill. My travel radius in my neighborhood, Pacific Heights, was limited to three blocks, I could go one block east and two blocks southwest. 
If I went in any other in any other direction or beyond those three blocks, death by sheer drop off greeted me. <laughs> Life at the top of the hill was starting to look overrated. <laughs> Defeated, I began turning down social invitations. I missed my friend Rachel's going away because it was at the top of two flights of stairs. I declined group dinners at friends' houses because inevitably stairs were involved and I was too embarrassed to be carried up. All the better anyway, since I hated answering the question, oh, what happened to you? In public, I noticed pitying head tilts from strangers and, and still others who looked at Alex and I perplexed, as if to wonder, how do you two have sex? <laughs> as I plunged into the world of ever increasing limitations and dwindling freedoms, I surfaced into a bizarre alternate universe filled with abnormally abnormally high amounts of care and concern. Friends offered help without expecting anything in return. Initially, I declined their offers because I felt like a gross burden. But my tune started to change when I noticed that complete strangers were beyond nice to me. Like the time I was at the Presidio Y pool, wheelchair bound and patiently waiting for the handicapped shower stall to open up. And when it did, a portly older woman wearing a frayed black swimsuit using a wooden cane also waiting for the showers, came over to help me. Here, honey, let me put the shower seat in front of the shower and clear space so you can wheel in easily, she said, her warm blue eyes smiling at me. Wow, thank you so much, I replied as I wheeled into the stall. Do you need anything else, she offered? More towels, shampoo? Now I was apparently in stage three, bargaining. <laughs> Except the magic of my stage three was that I didn't have to ask for what I wanted. It was like telepathic bargaining. From the United Ticketing Agent at SFO, oh, you can board early due to your special needs. Miss Lou, we've also arranged for a wheelchair to meet you at your destination. To the coordinators at the Asian Film Festival, good God, no, you don't need to wait in the ticket holder line. Head straight to the entrance of the theater. To the lifeguards at the pool, do you need any help being carried into the pool today? <laughs> Some people were, were a little begrudging with their help like the hostess of Hogs and Rocks. Well, we have a policy to see only completed parties, but uh, let me see if I can see you now. <laughs> Getting around started to get easier, first with strangers performing random acts of kindness, then with mobilized scooters. That's how I shopped Target, Safeway, and Walgreens. <laughs> Gliding down the aisles and beeping when people got in my way. I shopped at Costco while being pushed around on a pallet. I started to feel cocky, entitled. Dude, why doesn't Best Buy have motorized scooters? What's with this ghetto wheelchair? Enjoying the services offered to me by strangers eased me into the final stage of grief, acceptance specifically accepting help from my friends. And it was my friends who were able to get me to finally see the upside of being in a wheelchair. My friend Monica schemed up going to trendy nightclubs to skip the line yeah. and to head to Disneyland so we could ride the rides weight free. Yeah. <laughs> Neither of which we ended up doing, but just dreaming them up felt free. I feasted on the endless rainbow of kindness. Countless friends brought lunch over to my place. Amy offered to get me groceries from Molly Stones. Alicia drove me to the post office. And Kelly drove me to my doctor's appointment at UCSF. And Lisa splurged for valet parking at Zunia Cafe. I mean, how many times are you going to be in a wheelchair, she justified. And Alex, in addition to being my fabulous boyfriend, has been my cook, my garbage man, my dishwasher, my chauffeur, my housekeeper, my laundry washer, bellhop, and foot missing. <laughs> then there was the ultimate granddaddy of all cripple perks, the disabled parking placard. <laughs> when I finally got one of these at the DMV, I felt like I had arrived. For those of you who haven't ridden the fabulous path of crippleness, the placard allows you to park in any blue and green spot for as long as you want, and in metered parking spots for free. I was so into it that for a long time, Alex and I would pull into a metered spot and I would say, oh look, meters run Monday through Saturday from nine to six, but not for us. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I had been on the outside for so long that it was finally nice to be on the inn, even if it was just part of being part of the disability parking club. <laughs> Towards the end of March, I weaned myself off the wheelchair and back onto crutches. I should have been thrilled to return the wheelchair, or thankful that I even was able to get out of one. But I was a little bummed to have to start walking all on my own again. But not nearly as bummed as Alex, though. He had just perfected popping the wheelie. <laughs> While I was still largely confined to my apartment, it was freeing to be back on crutches. I could walk into the bathroom again. I very slowly regained the use of my legs. When you've lost something for what seems like eons, regaining that strength, however minor, is a great exercise in gratitude. That's how I felt the first time I went swimming and could push off the wall with my foot again. Or when seated, I could push off my foot to move the chair back. By April, I had enough strength to crush three blocks to a muni stop. Now I can hack about 10 blocks. People are still really nice. The doctors have given me a few more months before I'm thrown out of this world of unlimited kindness and back into the cold and unfeeling abyss of humanity. <laughs> I countered this abyss a few weeks ago in the handicapped shower stall of the pool locker room. It was the first day I'd attempted to walk around without crutches, using only my leg braces. These super sexy air casts that are like shin guard sandwiches on your lower legs. I was showering and midway through it, I heard a belligerent voice behind me. Are you handicapped? I turned around to see the shower curtain being held open by a cane. It was the portly old woman in her gray black swimsuit who had once helped me. Her ice cold blue eyes glared at me. Are you handicapped? Yes, I am. I am handicapped, I replied, stunned, sitting in the shower seat. Incredulous, she asked again, are you handicapped? I guess she didn't recognize me naked and not in a wheelchair. Yes, I am, I asserted. She closed the curtain only to follow up with a now frail tone. Well, can you hurry? It's cold standing here and waiting. When I limped out of the shower stall, I noticed that all other stalls, including another handicap stall, were completely open and empty. That was my first taste of the brutally unsympathetic abyss. At least it was a sign that I appeared to be getting better. Honestly, I will be thrilled when I can walk unaided for long distances, longer than 10 blocks, when I can take a shower standing up again, and when I can park and walk from anywhere in the parking lot. But until then, I'm carrying my crutch around as a visual cue to others that I'm still not 100%. So bring on the pity party and the early boarding privileges. I'll happily hobble along. Yeah.